In this lesson, we'll be talking about what fine-tuning is, and perhaps when you might decide you want to use it. Let's go through a brief outline of this lecture. We'll first talk about what fine-tuning is, and importantly, why. You might want to consider fine-tuning ChatGPT. We'll then go through some examples and use cases of fine-tuning to act as inspiration for what you might want to use it for in the future. After that, we'll talk a little bit about how fine-tuning works. This will help you to understand the steps in the process and some of the choices that can be made. We'll talk about the pros and cons of fine-tuning so that you can decide whether or not it's right for you. And finally, we'll look at the costs of fine-tuning. It will be by far the most expensive thing we do in this course, though still relatively cheap overall. Okay. So let's begin with what fine-tuning is. To understand fine-tuning from a more high-level perspective, it helps to use an analogy. Consider, for instance, students at a university. An undergraduate STEM student, although they may have a specific field of study, still acquires pretty broad knowledge. They'll learn a little bit about math, in particular, calculus, linear algebra, and probability. They'll learn a little bit about physics, like Newton's laws. They might learn a little chemistry and a little biology. Then they'll learn some programming. Those are the early years. But in the later years, these undergraduate STEM students get fine-tuned based on their particular interests. For instance, an engineer may decide to specialize in robotics. So they'd learn much more about physics and mechanics. Maybe a little more about biology in terms of biomechanics. And maybe some more programming. But they probably won't learn any more advanced math. Similarly, for a computer science student, they will start to specialize in programming, learning more about different programming languages, algorithms and data structures, databases, web development, cloud, distributed computing, compilers, and so forth. But they probably won't learn any more about biology or chemistry. And similarly, a math student will just go on to learn more advanced math, like real analysis, complex analysis, differential geometry, and so forth. You get the idea. So ChatGPT is like the generalist that knows everything, but may not reach peak performance at any particular task. Fine-tuning can make ChatGPT specialized, so that it becomes even better at some particular things. Now let's talk about why you might want to fine-tune ChatGPT. Well, as we previously discussed, you want to fine-tune ChatGPT in order to get it to perform well on some specific task. You want to make it specialized. But fine-tuning isn't necessarily the first approach you should try. Other techniques are probably worth trying first, like engineering a prompt to specify exactly what ChatGPT should respond with. As anyone who has done this enough has experienced, ChatGPT won't necessarily follow your instructions to a T. You can iterate on those instructions and try to get more and more specific, or try different approaches. That might work, but it might not. But it's worth trying. Another approach may be to use Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG. This may be helpful, depending on what you are trying to accomplish. Maybe prompt engineering isn't working, because it needs extra specific data to draw on, which can be accomplished with RAG. But RAG isn't perfect. It's possible that the documents you bring back based on similarity search are not actually relevant to your query, in which case, the model won't be able to use that information to provide a good answer. There are also complications with RAG that we haven't discussed in this course, such as the fact that sometimes we have to break documents into chunks before converting them into vectors. But if you choose a chunk size that's too small, then important concepts won't be covered entirely in one chunk. If you choose a chunk size that's too large, then your costs and computation time will increase. Or RAG may not be appropriate at all. For instance, if you're just trying to change the tone of an article, or to return a specific format. At this point, you might want to consider fine-tuning, to train ChatGPT to give you back what you really want. All you have to do is give it examples of how you'd like it to behave. So now let's talk about some examples of fine-tuning. Perhaps the greatest example of fine-tuning is ChatGPT itself. If you've studied NLP with me in the past, then you know that language models aren't actually trained to follow instructions. Instead, they are trained to complete text. That's why some critics of LLM say that it's just a really fancy autocomplete. Given as input, a sequence of words, all an LLM is trained to do is predict the next word. We call such models that have been trained this way foundation models. 
As an example of such autocomplete behavior, consider if you enter as your prompt, why am I here? You may expect the LLM to respond with something like, to live a meaningful and fulfilling life. But instead, it will likely respond with a question of its own. What is my purpose? Why would it do such a thing? The answer is because it's just continuing the text you gave it. It's likely that the continuous string of text, why am I here, what is my purpose, appears often in natural language documents. So we need to specifically train these foundation models to follow instructions. We do that by training the foundation model even further with examples where instructions have been successfully followed. These of course are still strings and the model is still being trained to autocomplete. It's just that instead of purely natural text that can be found anywhere on the web, it is trained specifically on strings that start with an instruction and end with that instruction being fulfilled. Here are a few more examples of how fine tuning can be used. One is tone adjustment. We've already seen how you can make ChatGPT talk like a pirate or a nerdy scientist, but there are even more specific applications. For instance, what if you want ChatGPT to talk like the lazy programmer? Probably not a great idea, but it's an example. Another example is to provide structured output that is different from the typical JSON that you already know can be produced. For instance, suppose you want to provide a recipe as input, and as output you want ChatGPT to return a Python list containing all the ingredients. The base version of ChatGPT might not be able to do that on its own, but by providing many examples, you can fine-tune ChatGPT to reliably produce this output. So we talked a little bit about how fine-tuning works, but to fully understand the options that are available to you, you need to understand some of the technical details. Training neural networks happens through a process called gradient descent. You can imagine it like walking down a hill to try and get to the bottom. There are two important things to think about during this process. One, how big the steps you take are. And two, how many steps you take. How big your steps are is called the learning rate. If your steps are too big, you might never converge and even make your model worse. If your steps are too small, your model might not get worse, but it will fail to converge and not achieve the desired result. How many steps you take is related to a parameter or more specifically, hyperparameter, called the number of epochs. The number of epochs is the number of times the model will loop through your dataset during training. You can imagine that the more times it loops through your dataset, the more effective the model will become at predicting the next word in that dataset. At the same time, it may simultaneously become worse at predicting the next word for data it was previously trained on in the past. Another option we'll get to choose is the batch size. This isn't as relevant for this particular course and should probably be left at its default value. Basically, it's the number of examples to consider when you take each step in the gradient descent process. A larger batch size leads to more stable training, but requires more memory. A smaller batch size is less stable, but can use less memory. All of these choices, like the learning rate, number of epochs, and batch size are called hyperparameters in machine learning nomenclature. This differentiates it from the weights inside the neural network, which are just regular old parameters. One very common question I used to get is, how do I choose these hyperparameters? The answer is that there's no satisfactory answer. There will be some guidelines in the next lecture based on OpenAI's recommendations, but it's mostly trial and error. Next, I want to talk about some of the pros and cons of fine tuning and regular prompt engineering to compare and contrast the two approaches. This will be yet another way for you to decide if fine tuning is right for you. First, let's talk about the pros of using regular prompt engineering. One major benefit is that you can get started right away. Unlike more traditional machine learning approaches, you don't need any data. You just instruct ChatGPT to give you what you're looking for. Another benefit is there is a smaller upfront cost. By cost, I'm not only talking about explicitly spending money, but also time and effort, compiling a dataset, and then paying for the training process. And after that, still more time and effort needs to be spent on evaluating whether or not training was successful. Another benefit of prompt engineering is that no technical knowledge is needed. You just ask ChatGPT what you want to ask, 
No need to write code to curate and clean your data set. No need to understand how deep learning works in order to ensure training has completed successfully. But there are some cons to prompt engineering as well. One disadvantage of prompt engineering is that you can't rely on it to retrieve the relevant data it needs to answer your query. The knowledge stored in an LLM isn't like the knowledge stored in a database. Another disadvantage of prompt engineering is that LLMs can forget what they have learned in the past. So even if something was in the training set, it may be forgotten by the time training is complete. Another well-known disadvantage is that LLMs can hallucinate or make up facts and more importantly, sound confident when doing so, which tricks you into thinking that it's the truth. This is tied to the previous disadvantages listed above, since forgetting or not retrieving the right data will result in fabricated answers. Another reason prompt engineering may not work well is that it can be inconsistent. For example, you might ask it to produce a JSON, but the JSON string might be invalid or contain different keys each time. One final disadvantage of prompt engineering is that the model can't learn new information. The model just is what it is, and prompt engineering won't change it. Now let's move on to the pros of fine-tuning. In contrast, fine-tuning does allow the model to learn new information. Simply use that information during the training process. Training can also help to prevent hallucination in certain niche areas. We discussed that the model might hallucinate if you ask it something it doesn't know the answer to. But with training, the model can become better and more knowledgeable about the data you use to train it with. Another benefit of fine-tuning is that it can lead to lower costs beyond the upfront cost of training. This isn't so relevant for this course because using your fine-tuned model is actually more expensive than the base chat GPT. This is more relevant for those of you who are training smaller models. The reason you might want to do this is because LLMs are generalist models. They perform moderately well on many different tasks, but they are rarely the best. Smaller models are specific rather than generalist, so they can only do a single thing, but they do that single thing better than a generalist LLM. In practice, you could fine tune a local LLM smaller than ChatGPT that ends up being more cost effective over time. Of course, you need to do the calculations given your usage demand to determine whether or not that would really be the case. Finally, let's talk about the cons of fine tuning. One immediate disadvantage is that you need to curate data to train the model with. This isn't particularly fun or engaging. Another immediate disadvantage is the high upfront cost. Training neural networks is significantly more costly than inference. For the OpenAI API in particular, the cost is much greater than simply prompting ChatGPT. Yet another disadvantage is that fine-tuning requires technical knowledge. You need to know how deep learning works in order to understand and debug fine-tuning. Finally, let's talk about costs. For comparison, let's recall how much regular ChatGPT costs. It costs 50 cents per 1 million tokens of input and $1.50 per 1 million tokens of output. The cost of a fine-tuned ChatGPT is much greater, and the fine-tuning process itself is even more expensive. During the training process, every token you look at in your training dataset will cost $8 per token. Note that, to compute this, you can't just count up the number of tokens in your dataset. You have to account for the fact that your model will see the same tokens multiple times. Recall that every epoch will loop through the entire dataset. Using your fine-tuned model is also more expensive. Input tokens cost $3 per million tokens. And output tokens cost $6 per million tokens.